Milí diváci, vítajte v Palchevo paláci. Vítame aj našich online divákov, ktorí nás sledujú prostredníctvom live streamu. Je tu posledný deň festivalu Bratislavské Hanusové dni. BHD je kultúrno-akademický festival na priesečníku kresťanstva dnešnej spoločnosti. Organizátorom festivalu je spoločenstvo Ladislava Hanusa, katolické akademické spoločenstvo, otvorené pre všetkých ľudí hľadajúcich pravdu. Ak by ste chceli byť súčasťou tohto spoločenstva, môžete sa prihlásiť do jedného z našich formačno-akademických programov. Najbližšie otvárame dva ročné programy, jeden online a jeden prezenčný program v Bratislave. Viac môžete nájsť na stránke slh.sk. Tento rok spoločenstvo Ladislava Hanusa oslavuje už svoje 20. výročie. A pri tejto príležitosti zakladáme Inštitút Ladislava Hanusa, ktorým chceme posunúť našu službu pre kresťanskú kultúru a verejný život ešte na vyšší level. Ak sa vám páči to, čo robíme a vidíte v tom zmysel a chcete, aby sme toho robili ešte viac a ešte lepšie, tak vás pozývam, aby ste sa stali tohto súčasťou a podporili finančne založenie tohto inštitútu. Viac informácií, ako podporiť, ale aj v samotnom inštitúte, nájdete na donio.sk lomeno ILH. Ďakujeme. Festival prebieha pod záštitou starostky Starého mesta Bratislava. Hlavní partnery festivalu sú Advokátska kancelária Lysina Rožko & Partners, spoločnosť Plout a Fond na podporu umenia, ktorý podporil Festival z verejných zdrojov. Partnery CUSK a Lesy Jasov. Hlavní mediálni partnery, konzervatívny denník Postoj, portál Nové mesto a denník Štandard. Keď ste prichádzali, tak na sedačkách ste našli BHD noviny. Tieto noviny si pre vás pripravili študenti 33. formačno-akademického programu SLH. Môžete si ich zobrať zo sebou, prečítať si ich, nájdete tam zaujímavé informácie o festivále, o spoločenstve. No a dnes na sedať čakajú dve podujatia. O malú chvíľu začne prednáška s názvom Transgenderizmus, realita versus citlivosť. A po nej o 20. hodine bude nasledovať tou show štyroch mladých ľudí o nich s Maxom Kašparu a s názvom Snowflake Generation. No a ako vždy je tu aplikácia Slido, prostredníctvom, ktorej sa môžete zapojiť do diskusie a položiť svoje otázky. Stačí, keď si vyťukáte do prehľadača sli.do a dáte heslo Veľkým BHD 22. No a môžete použiť aj našu Wi-Fi názvom Veľkým BHD a heslo je Hanusové dni 22, veľké H na začiatku. No a teraz už odozdávam slovo moderátorovi dnešného večera, Patrikovi Daniškovi. Patrik, nech sa páči. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm pretty sure you, you like books, and one of my favorite authors is Jane Austen, and she wrote a book, Sense and Sensibility, and she showed us that it is important to try to accommodate sense and sensibility, reason, truth, and sensibility. We will try to do the same tonight with our uh, guest. Uh, Dr. Crystal Ruth von Holt is a medical doctor. She's a specialist in a field of youth and, and uh, children medicine. She's already retired, but she worked for a lo long time in Germany, in India, in South Africa. Uh, she's, also, she's also a, resear a researcher. She did a research on various family issues. One of those is how relationship between parents, father and mother, whether it is good relationship, bad relationship, healthy, unhealthy, how it influences children and their identity. Uh, she's also policy influ influencer. Uh, when there was a debate in Germany in 2004 about family issues, she defended in, in the parliament position that child deserves father and mother. Uh, until 2017, she was director of the German Institute for Youth and Society. And she is also a member of Pediatric Committee for Psychosocial Development. And I know her from another organization called International Federation for Therapeutic and Counseling Choice, where she, for, uh, for some period of time in the past, served as a vice president. Now she's, uh, she's still uh, involved in this organization, which is, which is paying attention to issues of homosexuality and uh, transgender as well. 
she is a public figure, she, uh, writes and speaks on various topics, currently especially on topic on transgender, transgenderism and as a as a pediatrician, she, uh, she focuses on um, transgenderism uh, in kids and children and youth. Uh, she defends position that children should be properly and truthfully informed about issues of gender, sexuality, identity, and corporal reality. Just recently, I have heard an uh, interesting idea saying that transgender ideology is a threat, but it's not threat from transgender people. It's threat to transgender people. And I'm very happy we can invite our guest tonight, who will speak from her, from her uh, professional point of view, how to protect transgen transgender children from this ideology. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Crystal Ruth von Holt. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. A short note beforehand, anyone interested in the exact sources of information that I will give is welcome to write me an email and I will give additional information. I learned that Rod Dreher spoke at one of your previous conferences, and I love his book, Live Not By Lies. So full of stories of courageous Slovakian people. This is our challenge today, too, to live not by lies, to tell the truth as far as it's possible for us. In my talk about children and adolescents, can we put that a little bit more down? Is it okay? or? Oh, otherwise, it's just in the middle of my, just, just, a, yeah, okay, I think that's better. Thank you. In my talk today about children and adolescents with a transgender condition, I will mainly present facts. Knowing the facts helps us to have more compassion for the vulnerable, and deeply hurt children who struggle with their gender identity, and also have more compassion for the difficult situation parents are often in. I will have three points. The first one is terminology. The second, what do we know about social and medical transition, the so-called sex change? And third, what else do we know about children who suffer from transgender desires. The first challenge is clarity of terminology. The language around gender, sex, gender identity, transgender, gender phoria, gender incongruence is confusing and causes confusion. We are dealing with vulnerable children whom we respect, whom we love, whom we want to care for. But we are also dealing with an ideology that is full of lies and half-truths. This ideology uses words that are nebulous, that escape clear definitions. So our first task, or my first task, is clarity of terminology. Biological sex is an objective, clearly defined binary trait, male and female. There are only two sexes, there is no third sex. In the physical objective reality, an organism is male or female because it is structured, it's, it, because its structures point to their specific role in reproduction. This is true even when reproduction is not wanted or not possible. It has nothing to do with typical or untypical 
personality traits or behaviors. A girl does not become a boy because she likes to jump over fences. Regarding behaviors and preferences, there's a huge overlap between girls and boys, men and women. S uh, gender identity refers to an internal sense, a subjective feeling to be a male or a female person. For most people, this is not a big question. Most biological men identify as a boy or a man, and most biological women identify as a girl or a woman. Some individuals, however, experience an incongruence between their biological sex and their felt gender identity. And this is commonly called transgenderism. Transgenderism is the general term used to describe an incongruence between a child's feeling of who he or she is, boy or girl, and the material reality of their biological sex. In other words, the feelings and thoughts of these children do not match the reality of their bodies. The feelings may be strong and a child may adopt a transgender identity on the basis of these feelings. If a person experiences significant distress because of this incongruence, the official diagnosis gender dysphoria can be made. An even newer diagnosis is gender incongruence, for which no inner distress is required. Children with transgender feelings either wish to be of the other sex or are convinced that inside they are really of the other sex. A boy may say he has a boy's body but a girl's brain and therefore he really is a girl and wants to be seen as a girl. In many cases, children and adolescents with transgender feelings express a hatred towards their own body, especially towards the sexual characteristics of their body. A certain rejection of their own body is always present. Transgender feelings may start early in childhood or in puberty or later or any time later, and they can also change throughout life. It used to be a rare condition. Today, 3% of school children in the United States identify as transgender. Transgender clinics like the Tavistock Gender Clinic in London have seen a huge rise in referrals to their clinic. It used to be mainly boys, now it's overwhelmingly girls who struggle with their gender identity. Are transgender feelings inborn and biologically fixed? No. Transgender feelings are neither inborn nor biologically fixed. They can change throughout the lifespan. Attempts have been made to find a biological basis of transgender, but there is none. There is no laboratory test, no gene test, no hormone test, no neuroimaging test, that is no brain test, that can tell us which child is a transgender child and which is not. In other words, there is no objective diagnosis. Transgender is a psychological condition. It is a feeling, not an objective physical condition. Are some people born in the wrong body? No. Children with transgender feelings are biologically healthy children with healthy sex organs and normal physical development. They have two sex chromosomes in each cell of their body, including in each of their brain cells. The sex chromosomes are, as you probably know, 
XX for girls and XY for boys. They are the biological foundation for being a female or a male person. The sex chromosomes remain in each cell, also in each brain cell, from conception until death. They cannot change. In addition, in boys at about eight weeks gestation in the womb, their body starts to produce testosterone, the male sex hormone. Testosterone does not only flow with the bloodstream into the pelvis where male genitalia develop, it also flows into the brain. The concept that a boy can have a girl's brain and vice versa is not grounded in objective reality. Independent of individuals' behaviors, a boy has a boy's brain. A girl has a girl's brain. A girl does not become a boy because she loves to climb over fences. She simply remains a girl. And a boy does not become a girl because he exhibits behaviors that are not so typical for many boys or that are stereotypically associated with girls. He simply remains a boy. This is very important to know because the diagnosis of gender dysphoria in children relies on children's preferences for certain behaviors or plays or certain activities. But a boy does not become a girl because he prefers reading and drawing over football playing. He simply remains a boy. In the past, the Canadian psychotherapist Kenneth Zucker, his clinic was closed in 2015. He uh, records a case where a boy came to him and said, well, I have a boy's body, but I have a girl's brain, so I think I really am a girl. When Kenneth Zucker questioned that and talked to him, then the boy said, oh, well, I have to think about it again. Maybe then I'm not trans. I have some other problems. So you see that the label of transgenderism is sometimes pushed onto children who are simply deeply confused about who they are. Then they may grab on to some sort of thing. Oh, yes, I have heard. But when an adult lovingly challenges that, the boy may say, okay, maybe then something else is wrong with me. Let's talk about it. There is no evidence that some children are born with a transgender brain. The few studies on possible differences between brains of transgender and non-transgender individuals show inconclusive, inconsistent, and even contradictory results. One principal difficulty of such research is neuroplasticity. Human brain structures change throughout life, depending on experience, thinking, habitual behaviors. Addictive behaviors, for example, significantly change brain microstructure. A child with unresolved trauma has a different brain than a child with no history of trauma. Violinists have a different brain compared to people who do not play the violin. So differences that might be found in brain microstructures of transgender adults would most likely be the result of certain behaviors and thoughts and not their cause. Transgender feelings, gender dysphoria, gender incongruence are psychological conditions. From a scientific point of view, transgender is a vague, ill-defined phenomenon. And gender dysphoria and gender incongruence are unreliable, subjective diagnoses. As I said before, a boy does not become a girl simply because he prefers quietly reading and drawing rather than playing football. In, in adolescence, therefore, the diagnosis of transgenderism 
is usually a self-diagnosis, and sadly, it's not challenged often enough. But it is no objective diagnosis. The problem now, and that's now number two, that is today that these psychological conditions are treated as if they were severe biological conditions. The new treatment that's currently pushed on children and parents are pushed to agree is called gender-affirming treatment. Another very confusing term, because instead of helping children as far as possible to align their thoughts with the reality of their body, this new treatment affirms the child's false belief that inside it is really of the other sex. The treatment affirms rather than heals the split between mind and body. In an immature child, it cements the child's fantasy that it can change sex, rather than helping a child to find peace with the objective reality of their body. So-called gender-affirming treatment means social and medical transition. In order to live to some extent in the role of the other sex and to change the outer appearance of a person. We live in liberal societies, so adults have the liberty to do this. But we should do everything we can to protect children from social and medical transition. Medical transition means puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, and often surgical operations. Let's have a look at that. Puberty blockers are usually given to the child when the child is about 11 years old, but sometimes already when the child is only eight or nine. Puberty blockers are hormone-like substances. They stop puberty, they stunt growth, and block the production of estrogen in the girl and testosterone in the boy. They are the first medical step towards transition. Let's look more closely at the puberty blockers. Normally, puberty is the time for genital maturation, for sperm and egg cells to mature and become capable of fertilizing or being fertilized. Puberty blockers block this process. Sperm cells and egg cells cannot mature. The child remains infertile. Puberty is also immensely important for growth in bone density. Puberty blockers lead to a diminished bone mineralization with a high risk of osteoporosis and later fractures. In girls, in addition, in normal puberty under the influence of estrogen, the female pelvis considerably changes its configuration in order to allow room for a baby to pass through. In girls who take puberty blockers, the pelvis remains in a childlike position. Should a girl later decide to live in her natural sex again and become pregnant, her pelvis may not have the right configuration and may not be suitable as a birth canal. Pregnancy may end in obstructed labor, a possibly grave danger for mother and child, even for their lives. The endocrinologist Michael Leidlaw comments that it's completely unknown if, after stopping puberty blockers, there will still be a developmental window for the female pelvis to reach its optimal female shape. So the danger remains. And the last, puberty is also crucial for brain development, which happens under the sex-appropriate hormones. In puberty, the human brain undergoes major changes. Puberty blockers may lead to an impairment of brain maturation, to an impairment of cognitive skills development, 
they may lead to a potential drop in IQ and also to depressive symptoms. Data from the Tavistock Gender Clinic in London reveal after a year on puberty blockers, children reported greater self-harm and greater suicidality. Girls reported more emotional problems and developed an even greater dissatisfaction with their body. So then why are puberty blockers given? Remember, children with a transgender condition have healthy bodies. So why are we interfering in healthy bodies? Proponents of puberty blockers say that they give the child time to consider if they are really transgender, and that all adverse effects would be reversible once puberty blockers are stopped. But this is highly questionable, and there's no evidence for that. In addition, a groundbreaking study from Amsterdam, the main center, the main world center for treating children with transgender issues. A groundbreaking study from Amsterdam shows none of the children on puberty blockers decided to reverse course and live in their natural sex. All children decided to continue with cross-sex hormones, and the vast majority then also had surgeries. Not a single adolescent opted for the possibility to align its thoughts with its body. In reality, therefore, puberty blockers, together with social transition, about which I will talk later, reinforce a child's false belief that inside he is of the other sex, and that the rift between body and mind cannot heal. If allowed to go through normal puberty, the majority of children with a transgender condition will lose their transgender thoughts. That's very important to know. The majority will align their thoughts and feelings with their body. However, now we have seen in this Amsterdam study, all children on puberty blockers kept their incongruence between body and mind. All children continued with cross-sex hormones and opted for a life that involves a lifelong war against one's own body. Cross-sex hormones are usually given when the child is 16 years old, sometimes already much earlier at age 13, for example. Cross-sex hormones, that is high doses of testosterone for the girl and high doses of estrogen for the boy. Don't forget, these medicines are given to children with completely healthy bodies. Cross-sex hormones increase the risk for heart diseases, thromboembolic diseases, liver diseases, possibly deadly blood clots, possibly cancer and depression. Children who started on puberty blockers and then continue with cross-sex hormones remain infertile, and this may not be reversible even when these medicines are later stopped. Sometimes it may be reversible, but it may not be reversible. Once a child has undergone its sex reassignment surgeries, the sterility will be permanent and always irreversible. Can a child put on puberty blockers at age 11 grasp the long-term consequences of such treatment? Medical sterilization for any other reason is usually prohibited for individuals under the age of 25. That's how it is in Germany. Children whose brains are still undergoing major changes are not able to give valid consent to treatments that produce infertility and potentially permanent infertility. Once individuals have had their surgical operations with the removal of ovaries and testicles, the sterility will be irreversible. 
Surgical procedures are often done at age 18, sometimes earlier. They involve removal of breasts, ovaries and uterus in the girl, and removal of male genitals in the boy, all of them healthy organs. Breast removals have already been performed in children as young as 13 or 14 years old, and I recently heard about a case in Western Europe where a girl had her breasts removed on the uh, diagnosis of transgenderism when the girl was 15 years old. Michael Lightlow again comments, we are giving very harmful medicines on the basis that there is no objective diagnosis. If parents hesitate to agree with such drastic and destructive medical procedures, Child Protective Services may threaten to remove the child from home. I remember such a case. Their argument, children with a transgender issue have a higher risk for suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts. That is true, and that needs to be taken seriously. But can cross-sex hormones and surgery reduce this risk? The world's largest and most comprehensive, co most comprehensive data set, which is from, from Sweden, shows in a new study published in 2020 that neither hormones nor sex reassignment surgeries can reduce the higher rates of depression, anxiety disorders, and suicide attempts of individuals with a transgender condition. So neither cross-sex hormones nor surgery can bring the desired happiness and peace. What they bring is possibly diminished bone density, a lifelong dependency on medications with potentially serious side effects and infertility. The methodologically best research that we have today, this is another study from Sweden, shows the rate of completed suicides 10 years after sex reassignment surgeries was 19 times higher in people with a transgender condition than in the general population. These are all hard facts that should make us think what is really the best for our children. Before medical transition comes social transition. There is now a new study out where social transition was started in children while average of the children average age was eight years, but some of the children were younger than six years when social transition was started. Social transition means consequently treating a child as if he or she were of the other sex. To always address a girl by a boy's name using only male pronouns, referring to her as he and his. Social transition requires rigid use of male clothing in a girl, male hairstyle in a girl. It reinforces sex stereotypes. It manipulates an immature mind and it alienates the child further from the reality of its body. Social transition is not a neutral intervention. It reinforces on a daily basis the child's false belief that inside he is really of the other sex. It leaves the child in its fantasy world. It involves parents, teachers, counselors, others in authority. We, adults, are responsible but the child has to pay the price. Medications and surgeries that seriously harm their bodies and cause infertility. Social transition, we can say, is like a form of psychological addiction. It raises children's expectations that transitioning will solve all their problems. 
It prepares children for harmful medical transition. The child is suffering from a psychological condition, then it's promised, oh, when you have social transition, you will feel better. The child does not feel better. Oh, when you will be started on puberty blockers, you will feel better. You have seen that the problems, especially in the girls, got worse a year on puberty blockers. Oh, you will be better once you are on cross-sex hormones. Child does not feel better. Oh, you will be better once you have had surgeries. And then children are grown up and they sometimes wake up. And I recently read the testimony of a detransitioner, a woman who had lived as a man and then went back to live in her natural sex and she said, I was running away from myself all the time. So what else do we know? Let me have a look at my clock. <laughs> Many children and adolescents with gender dysphoria suffer from mental health problems. A representative Finnish study shows that 75% of the transgender adolescents were currently or had previously been treated for a severe psychiatric disorder, usually depression, anxiety disorder, suicidal thoughts. In 68%, that's the great majority of these adolescents, the, the psychiatric disorders came first Gender dysphoria came later. In other words, psychiatric disorders might be a cause for developing transgender thoughts. Again, the majority of these children were girls. A large study from the United States published in 2018 confirms this. Among children with trans transgender issues, there is a high prevalence of psychiatric disorders especially depression and anxiety and suicidality. And the vast majority of the children had their psychiatric disorders before the onset of gender dysphoria. Another recent study by Littmann about adolescents with a so-called rapid onset of gender dysphoria shows the same. The majority of the adolescents was suffering from at least one mental health disorder before the onset of gender dysphoria. Many also had had a history of trauma before adopting a transgender identity. The majority of these children had severe emotional problems dealing with the challenges of everyday life, including the normal developmental challenges of puberty. The children had problems coping with normal everyday conflicts. They had social anxieties and very little capacity to handle negative emotions. And Littmann writes, adopting a transgender identity can be for these children a maladaptive coping mechanism. That is a fantasy escape from everyday life. If I would be somebody completely else, maybe then I would feel better. When psychiatric disorders begin before the onset of gender dysphoria, it's not possible that depression and suicidal thoughts are caused by a parent's refusal to give puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. It's much more likely the other way around. Adopting a transgender identity can be a defense mechanism against emotional pain, the emotional pain that comes with mental health problems and with trying to deal with everyday life. This would also explain why these children have huge expectations that medical transition will solve all their emotional and other problems. Lisa Littmann describes one girl who even stopped 
her antidepressive medicines because she felt, now I am transitioning, so everything should be fine. But this is not true, of course. Suicidality and depression can also be a result of unresolved childhood trauma. Maybe you have seen the story of Walt Heyer. It was uh, uh, done specifically for this conference. He is a very courageous man. He experienced several forms of severe childhood trauma. His grandmother emotionally abused him by telling him that as a boy he is not good enough and that he would be more loved by his family if he were a girl. His father physically abused him for cross-dressing, although he only cross-dressed because he felt he wanted to be loved. And his grandmother told him, if you were a girl, you would be loved. But the father's behavior alienated him only further from his father, when in reality he would have needed his father as a positive role model. Then Walt Heyer was sexually abused by an uncle, and when he told his family about that, they did not believe him. The experience of several multiple childhood trauma called adverse childhood experiences are much more common in children who identify as transgender compared to other children. Adverse childhood experiences is that what what Haya experienced. Emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, but also experiences like having a problem drinker at home, witnessing violence between the parents, separation of the parents, death of a parent. A new study from Australia confirms this. The vast majority of the children with gender dysphoria had a history of several adverse childhood experiences in the family. Family conflicts, loss of separation, loss by separation from a parent or grandparent. Mother had a mental illness and was depressed, witnessing domestic violence. So adverse childhood experiences, especially when there is several of these experiences, may be one of the contributing factors, one of the possibly causal factors that may lead a child to developing transgender thoughts. This may be especially true in a sensitive child. For traumatized children, adopting a transgender identity may be a defense mechanism against emotional pain. As I quoted this detransitional woman before, I was always running away from myself because it was so painful and nobody helped me dealing with my real underlying problems. Do I still have some time? What is it? How many? Three minutes. <laughs> the leading American brain researcher, Alan Shaw, is of the opinion that traumatic attachment experiences in the first two years of life can be a cause for a child to develop transgender issues. He says we understand failure at gender identity acquisition to be rooted in an attachment dynamic between the mother and the baby, and this may be completely not due to the fault of the mother, but due to very complicated circumstances, sometimes depression of the mother. Attachment is the bond between a small child and its parents. Attachment trauma can be very hidden, and that's why sometimes children in kindergarten, when they say, oh, a girl, oh, I'm really a boy, I want to be a boy, People think it's inborn. It's not inborn. It's very often due to early attachment trauma. If parents, for reasons completely out of their control, cannot be emotionally available for a small child, this may be a traumatic experience for that child. A small, sensitive child that does not feel seen, does not feel heard, does not feel understood in its most basic needs, 
who feels unloved may experience deep trauma through this. If a child is left alone for hours and hours and nobody hears him crying, this can be a traumatic experience for a vulnerable child. And attachment trauma is usually not a one-time event, but often ongoing. Identity develops through attachment. Gender identity develops, development is inextricably linked with general identity development. And Alan Shaw writes, traumatic attachment experiences in the first two years of life negatively impact brain development. They negatively impact a child's sense of self and can produce deficits in identifying a corporeal image of self. In other words, if a child's brain in the first two years of life experiences overwhelming stress due to attachment trauma, it may not be able to develop a secure sense of self. The result is severe self-insecurity. Not having had the chance to develop a clear corporeal image of self, the child may grab onto the fantasy solution that inside it is of the other sex. Identifying as transgender again might be a defense mechanism against the pain of deep self-insecurity. However, underneath the transgender identity, the pain of deep self-insecurity remains. So attachment trauma, multiple adverse childhood experiences, and mental health issues may in some cases be causes for a child to develop a transgender condition. Recent research also reveals that social and environmental factors can play an important role in the development of a transgender condition. Vulnerable children, especially those with mental health problems with an autism spectrum disorder or traumatized children, may identify as transgender through peer group contagion or social contagion. Glamorizing pictures of transgender lives on the internet raise the hope of these children that they will finally have a better life when they transition. Again, a transgender identity may function as a maladaptive coping mechanism to deal with seemingly unbearable emotional pain due to unresolved trauma or because a child has a limited emotional capacity and feels overwhelmed by everyday emotional challenges. These vulnerable children often have high expectations that transition will solve all their problems. Previously, gender dysphoria was treated with watchful waiting because we have heard that in most cases, children will lose their transgender thoughts or with standard psychological counseling, family counseling. However, therapy bans now in many countries make this very difficult. Rather than helping children to align their gender identity with the reality of their biological sex, children are being pushed onto the extremely harmful and damaging path of transition, and parents are pushed to go along with it. It's becoming more and more difficult to help children not to wage a war against their body, but to find peace within their bodies. Some countries, however, recently have reversed their policies. Sweden reversed its health policy right, quite recently and now prohibits puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones in children under the age of 18. The Secretary of State for Health in the United Kingdom said, with regard to the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, we have failed our children. We all need to think in you. Transgender is a serious condition. The children deserve our compassion, our respect, but they also deserve to know the truth. Transgender is a psychological condition and should be treated psychologically, not with a surgical knife. We need to find better, more humane and effective ways to help children who struggle with their gender identity. So a quick 
summary at the end. There's probably much that we do not know about transgender issues. What we do know is a transgender condition is neither inborn nor biologically fixed. Social and medical transitions are deeply harmful medical interventions, destroying healthy tissue and lead to potentially permanent sterilization. Many children with transgender issues suffer from mental health disorders, autism, or have experienced multiple childhood trauma, including attachment trauma. In many of them, mental health disorders, including depression and suicidality, came first. The onset of gender dysphoria was later. To say that these children were depressed or suicidal because their parents did not comply with the child's wish to change sex is wrong. Mental health disorders and childhood trauma, including attachment trauma, are possible contributing factors to the development of a transgender condition. Transgenderism might be a defense mechanism against emotional pain. Social contagion and social pressures may be, for some vulnerable children, contributing factors to announce a transgender identity. The children deserve our compassion, our respect, but they also deserve to know the truth. A lifelong war against one's own body cannot reflect the truest identity of these children. We need to find better, more humane and more effective ways to help them and not to leave them alone. Thank you very much. So I will have a couple of questions for the beginning. Then you will be asked to ask from the audience. And we will also try to go through as many questions from uh, Slido as possible. So prepare your questions. And also, please, uh, uh, if you want to write any questions into the system or vote for questions which uh, you find to be most interesting. So, Dr. Von Holt, I would like to ask maybe for the beginning. There was a lot of arguments which we, which we heard uh, about um, possible harms which uh, gender reassignment uh, procedures can cause either social or, or medical or chirurgical. What do you think is the strongest argument in your view uh, why, why people should not uh, encourage children uh, in, in their gender dysphoria, encourage them to, to use names, to use pronouns of the, of the desired sex? Well, because those children are children who are already suffering and vulnerable. And many say the only thing that was offered to them was the so-called transitioning process. But as we have seen, transition leads to possibly permanent sterility. It destroys healthy tissue. It cannot reach the desired goal of reducing suicidal thoughts, suicidal attempts, and uh, depression and anxiety. So the effect regarding psychological results is zero. The, effect, the re, um, effects on the body are only harmful and negative. So I don't know why one should push a child along this path. Maybe it's done out of helplessness, but we need to find better ways to serve these children, to really help them, to listen to them, to love them, to see underneath 
the surface. Uh, maybe one additional question to this. Why do you think fertility is so important? <laughs> fertility means life. And it's a, it's a capacity of every human being. And if that's not possible in, in, in a person, very often it's a tragedy. Sometimes it's wanted, but then people choose. Um, but here, it's a healthy body, a child that does not yet know what it means at the age of 11 is put on a pathway and at the end finds itself with uh, being infertile for life. Uh, this is something that really a grown-up person who understands the long-term consequences of decisions, um, a, a, a grown-up person can make that decision. But for a child, I believe it's, um, I, I, I'm missing the words, it's a severe, severe injustice to take away that ability and the capacity of having children for no reason at all regarding the body. Mm. There are many arguments from the other side, uh, proponents of the, of the opposite uh, idea that children should be affirmed in their desired sex. And they also argue with scientific Mm -hmm. research and, mm. and papers and, uh, and uh, data, they, they say that if children do not go through uh, this transition process, the likelihood of si suicide would be higher uh, than if they, if they are, uh, would be higher. For example, Joe Biden's administration recently issued um, statements, fact sheets saying, uh, uh, quoting uh, certain uh, research uh, done on this topic. Uh, why do you think those, uh, those uh, studies which you quoted are better or why do you rely on these and, and not the other ones? Yeah, that's a very important question and I'd like to give two examples from the research. I mentioned already the 2020 Swedish study uh, with the largest data set that shows that neither cross-sex hormones nor surgery can reduce uh, depression and suicide attempts. This research was first published in 2019 and it said, well, cross-sex hormones do not help reduce suicide attempts and depression, but surgery does. Then several groups of US American researchers looked at the data again and found severe and numerous statistical errors in the analysis of the data. So they wrote back, there were several letters written back independently by several researchers to that original Swedish researcher, Brenström, and the editor of the journal in which this uh, study was published. So they looked at the data again, and now you'll find on the internet, oh yes, neither sex hormones nor surgery can in any way reduce suicidality, depression, anxiety. But in the meantime, before that correction was published, and you can find it online, many other articles copied that. Oh, surgery helps. Surgery helps. Second, very important example. There was a study published, I think in 2016, that said if parents support their children in the transitioning process from early on, children's mental health problems will go away. Another researcher, Walter Schum, quite a famous family researcher, asked the original researcher of that study for the raw data. That means not only the short thing that was tab uh, published, but for all the original data. And he came to the conclusion, numerous statistical errors and omissions 
were made in analyzing the data, and he found actually that even when parents really support the transitioning process of their children, the mental health problems remained. The problem was, or one of the problem was, that the original article was cited in other articles more than 370 times. So it, the message was spread. And now comes a little other article and says, it's not that. There are numerous statistical errors. Okay, we can say one study says this, and the other st study says this. Let's do more research. Let's do another study. Let's look more closely what is really true. But the problem, and this is really the main problem, is that health policies, like now the United States health policies, are based on these really flawed and highly questionable studies. So on very superficial studies, rather than saying, okay, we don't know, let's do more research, health policies rely on superficial studies with probably a lot of statistical errors. And po health policies mean that uh, counselors, psychotherapists are forced to follow that. But the basis of that, the scientific basis, is zero. And, and that is very sad, because the child has to pay the price. We adults, we don't pay the price. And do we know uh, Sweden, which, uh, which research they did, uh, they, uh, they accepted for their decision to stop with uh, crosses, crosses, uh, puberty block, mm -hmm. blockers and um, cross-sex hormones? I don't know, but I think it was this Brandstrom um, uh, uh, research, because it's really a representative study, it's really a good study, and it showed, and, and it, this is, I mean, the Brandstrom and the editor of the uh, scientific journal, they were courageous enough, enough to uh, publish the correction they published the correction, and you can see it on the internet. And, and this was a very important um, information that neither cross-sex hormones nor um, surgeries can really reduce the mental health problems. Uh, so I assume, I mean, it was first the Swedish Pediatric Society, but in spring this year, the whole uh, Swedish health policy followed. So I think it's time for your questions now uh, from the audience. Uh, who would be the first? Ano, nech sa páči tam vzadu. Ano, vzadu sa hlási pán. Tu, 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 pred vami. Hello. So I have a question. There were questions in Slido that alluded to whether you had any publications or whether there were any peer-reviewed articles that would support your position on this. I would respond that the science has been hijacked on this issue. But these questions are still, still relevant as this is not sufficient as an answer. Shouldn't the church build its own relevant scientific institutions? If we want to prevent science from being ideologized, we must have our own science and be good at it. So the question is whether the church should have its own... Well, I think generally speaking, well, I think uh, the science has been ideologized on this issue. And just to point that scientific studies has been somehow flawed is not enough. If we want to really deal with this issue, we as Catholics should be more I mean, focused on building our own scientific institutions as we have done, done it in the past, so for example, universities. What should we do to make sure that science will not be hijacked and yes. we will have real, real and truthful data? That, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, one of the problems is money. There is very often very little money for independent research, research that is, does not follow the, the, the mainstream but is really independent. So that is 
it's a very good idea. Um, yes, Mr. Geze. Dobrý deň. Chcel by som sa pani doktorky spýtať... Poč, prepáčte, chvíľočku vydržte. Ano? Nemáme staničku prekladaciu, prinesiete nám pre pani doktorku. Ano. Môžete, nech sa páči. Uh, neviem, či to funguje. Ja. Chcel by som sa pani doktorky spýtať, že čo by mali teda transrodoví ľudia robiť, aby boli šťastnými? problém like many other vulnerable children, need love. A lot of love. What is love? Love is the joy of not being alone. Love is eye contact. Love is I hear you. I hear your cry. I see the sadness in your eyes. I can understand that it's very difficult for you. Don't be afraid, I will not leave you alone. One of the most saddest things for a child is if a child is, does not feel understood, does not feel understood in his difficult things, does not feel hurt and is left alone. I have heard that children or young people with a transgender condition say, I was sitting in my room, I was crying a lot. I didn't know why, but nobody heard me. So this is what we all can offer children, a safe room, a safe space where they can grow, where they can grow through their body too. Identity develops through the body too. And um, yeah, I, I could give an example, but maybe we'll take some more time for questions. And if I can continue with that question, perhaps the people who are already adults and who feel, uh, who feel this, uh, this gender in, uh, incongruence, what should they do to, to live uh, happy lives? I cannot um, tell other adults what they should do. Uh, they really have to make their own decisions. It's generally agreed upon that the brain is fully mature at the age of 25, not before. So adults at the age of 25, more or less, are mature enough to know what the long-term consequences are of their decisions. I think one problem they do face is that very often the only message they get is you need to transition. So alternatives should be more open to them. Let's see if there is unresolved trauma in your life. Let's see if there is possibly depression or another psychiatric problem that was there before you started with wanting to change your sex. So really open exploring and at the same time, um, I mean, social isolation is another big problem, not leaving people alone. Uh, so one of the questions is asking about children uh, and parents, parents, how, uh, how should parents react when uh, as an example, their son, star son starts to wear uh, girls' clothes. Um, what would you recommend to these parents? I recommend that they see a wise counselor because often parents cannot 
cope with it alone. Sometimes, and I mean this is only an example, and every boy is different and every family is different, but in the literature, for example, it is that sometimes the mother may be depressed or may be chronically ill, and she desperately feels that she cannot cope with having a boy, that she may even be afraid of male aggression, or that she herself was sexually abused, uh, when she was small, so she desperately wishes for a girl, and now she has a boy. And a very sensitive boy can sense that. He doesn't want to... Um, um, he, 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 he wants his mother's love. He, he doesn't want to do anything that he feels uh, his mother doesn't like. And uh, so there can be a dynamic between mother and child, but it's not the mother's fault if she is depressed. And I would say they, in most cases, they need help from the outside. And that's a big problem in countries who have a therapy ban laws, who require um, counselors and therapists to offer the transitioning path um, because that's seen as the solution, but it's not. Máme tu otázku z publika. Ja by som sa chcela spýtať, aká je úspešnosť terapii a tých detí, alebo ktorí sa dne chcú dať preoperovať, ale chceli by teda e, žiť v súlade s svojim telom, aká je úspešnosť týchto terapií. Či sa to vie nejako, aj percentuálne, ale aspoň plus minus. Ďakujem. Aspoň trocha približne. Úspešnosť. Úspešnosť terapií. Áno? I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any specific um, percentages. Aspoň približne, či je nejaká úspešnosť? Nech sa páči, to nás slačo povedal. Hi, so I would actually have a lot of notes on this um, lecture, but uh, firstly I would like to say that I'm really sad that there is no transgender person represented because we are talking about them without them. Um, secondly, that also transgenderism, you are talking about it as a condition, but transgender people were removed from the list of diseases of the WHO a long time ago. Uh, but my question would be that your argument actually started with saying that uh, there is only two genders, which is very heteronormative perception of the world. We could also consider very ideologistic. And there are a lot of studies, not only medical, but also social ones, who prove that gender and sex, biological sex, is a spectrum. So then what about intersex people who are no less than 2% of the population, for example? Thank you. Yes, that's an important question. The so-called disorders of sex development, DST, or what is now often called as intersexuality. And that's one of the other problems of confusion. Trans people with a transgender condition, and I said a condition, I know that it's removed from the list of uh, psychological disorders. And it's, it's not inborn. Uh, there's no, no um, evidence for that. So a transgender condition is for people with a completely biologically healthy body. The so-called intersexuality, those are conditions with clearly objective biological abnormalities. In almost all cases, that's when a child is born with ambiguous genitals that may not look quite clearly male or female. 
In some rare cases, like the Turner syndrome, it will be detected only in puberty, though one can also detect it in a newborn. Um, but this is something completely different. That is a usually genetic, biological abnormality and doesn't have anything to do with people who have a transgender condition. There is no transgender brain. Transgender is a psychological phenomenon, whereas intersexuality is a biological phenomenon. I will read another question from Sli Slido. Mm, Dr. Von Holt, you have been introduced as an expert on this topic. Do you have any citation, citation, citations, citations uh, in relevant uh, scientific publications on this topic? Um, I have talked about that but uh, I do not appear in official scientific papers, most likely because my opinion is different than what is politically correct today. However, everything that I cited today that is really solid research, and even if you feel that it's difficult to decide what type of research one should believe, I would ask you to consider common sense. Does it align with common sense to send a child down a path of medically harmful transition in order to deal with a psychological problem? Does it align with common sex, uh, with common sense to, to destroy, sorry to say that word, to destroy healthy body parts in a child that is completely biologically healthy? I'm not saying that those children do not suffer, but we need to find better ways. Uh, it's a question about uh, the church, a uh, similar, a little bit similar to uh, one already asked, but also the church brought modern science and universities uh, to the world. Uh, today, it has no scientific institutions. How then do we want to oppose LGBT ideology? Um, church, uh, uh, church brought modern science and universities to the world, but now, uh, today, it has no scientific institutions. Uh, how then do we want to oppose LGBT ideology? I think that's a question to all of the, or to all of us. I mean that there are very few scientific institutions that do research on how we could better help children. That's again comes down to that there is no money for that. But what we can do to do better research, to, to help children better, I think that's a, a challenge to all of us. Maybe I could modify the question, or basically it presupposes that people of the church, believing people, Christians, will have a different opinion on the topic like uh, non-Christians. Is, uh, do you think, or can you see in scientific community that there is a difference in opinion uh, among uh, believing Christians and non-believers? My argument was really based on biology on the objective reality of the body, of the importance of the body, that we develop our identity through our bodies. So it was not specifically Christian. Of course, being a human or interpreting human being always involves a worldview, always, whatever. 
but I was not uh, arguing specifically from a Christian worldview, but from a worldview of biology and of the body. And other questions <laughs> from, from the audience, please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Lady here. Yeah, hello. Uh, I would like to ask you a practical question as a parent. I don't know how is it in Germany, but uh, in Slovakia it started to be slowly but surely organizing Pride Week in schools. Uh, how can we parents fought against that with our common sense and, and politely? What should we do against that? And uh, what are your experience uh, from Germany or when you travel the world? How is it in schools? Or if it is actually allowed, maybe even question to Mr. Danishka, how is it in Slovakia? Is it allowed that a school organizes week, Pride Week, without even us parents letting us know? So how is it? How can we pre pretend our children from this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think that's really a question that uh, you need to look at in, uh, in, in, in Slovakia. Uh, in Germany, not much is being done, but parents need to come together for that and discuss together what are their values, what do they want that their children are being taught, what do they not want, and then together, maybe even starting an organization, having a voice in the public sphere, rather than everybody having to um, fight on its own or, or uh, being alone. So it's good to uh, come together and find a common strategy about what you would like your children. And what I would suggest for a, for a, for a Christian school, um, I would suggest that they have guidelines about what their values are and what they want uh, uh, to be seen in, in, in their schools. If I can add to that uh, regarding schools, what should a teacher do if, if he has a, a student in, in his room, uh, in, uh, in his school and classroom uh, identifying as tra transgender? Uh, what should be the best approach of the, of the teacher? Mm -hmm. Again, I cannot speak for a teacher what he or she should do or should not do. But I would recommend, and I know that from a school in Germany, that the school um, prepares guidelines, general guidelines. So then when something happens, uh, the teacher is not left alone, but he knows that there are certain guidelines. And I think a Christian school, for example, can um, have the guideline that we believe that the body is an integral part of identity, that children grow through their body, and that we do not believe that a lifelong war against one's own body is really reflecting the truest identity of children. We teach biology. We have the guideline that children who are at our school can only be called by the name that reflects their natural sex and can only be called with pronouns that reflect the reality of their body. Or maybe an, 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 an example, um, it was a 14-year-old child from a very difficult home, and the child was, supposed, and, and the child was, um, was going by a boy's name in school. And the child was supposed to spend vacation with some of her relatives. And the relatives were asking themselves, well, what should we do? Should we now call this girl by a boy's name, because this is what she's used from school? Or should we really say of what we believe is, a tr is the truth? 
And then it, it, the relatives, it was a couple, they had children, uh, also they also had children. So the father of this, uh, the, of, of this family, and I think it's really important in that case to be the father. The father very lovingly said to this 14-year-old girl, look, we know you, we know you are a girl. We will call you when you are here on your vacation. We will call you by your girl's name. The girl was happy. The girl, the girl could relax. The girl played with the other children. She liked to be with a wife. She, she felt that she was being held, psychologically held, that there was a safe space. And she agreed to that. So we can have the, the, the courage to lovingly say the truth. Jakub, uh, Thank you. I would like to ask uh, why uh, in recent years, uh, transsexualism is more common in girls than in boys. I am not sure. I do not know. I can only, uh, from, from what you read, uh, on people who say that they, girls, that they lived for a while as a man and then de-transitioned again to live as a woman, very often they tell that they had some eating disorder or some other psychological problem so they felt they could run away from all this pain by being a person of the other sex. Sometimes they say that they were sexually harassed. Maybe they developed breasts very early, earlier than the other girls in their classroom. So they hated their breasts. They felt that they had to conform to certain sex stereotypes that in their family it was expected that they only behaved like this and this and not like this and this. So they felt very insecure. They felt sexually harassed. That's another big problem, not to let our children be exposed to early sexualization, but to let them remain children and to protect them from a sexualized atmosphere. So sometimes then these girls who just feel very uncomfortable in their bodies, instead of helping them to find peace with their bodies, they may find on the internet, oh, maybe I should get rid of my breasts and so on and so on. So this might be a reason in some of the girls. Um, there is one question which, uh, which is close to this one and it is asking about, um, about activity of parents, whether, whether uh, behavior of parents can influence uh, starting of gender dysphoria. Um, for example, if they, if they uh, uh, treat their daughter uh, as a boy or vice versa. Many factors can influence a child to adopt a transgender identity. So one really has to look at each child and the biography. Kenneth Zucker, I talked about him. He, his clinic was closed in 2015. He uh, tells about several children who developed gender dysphoria and their mothers were severely depressed when those children were very young. Um, so he recommends, for example, treating depression in mothers so that mothers can be emotionally more available to their children. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yes, uh, over here. Good, good evening, doctor. My name is Shimon Sadowski, and I work as a researcher at the Communities University at the Faculty of Mathematics. And this year, uh, uh, our faculty was put under the pressure uh, to, in order to obtain a, a funding from some European institution. We were forced to accept some uh, 
Gender Equity Committee at our faculty. So I would like to ask you uh, whether you have encountered such situation in your professional life at the university or, or somewhere in the medical environment and how to face it and how to do research truly freely without the prejudice to accept some, some say, axioms of, of this or that ideology. Thank you. I worked for a number of years in a small institute and we did not get any public money and that was our luck. So uh, if you have enough money to be independent, to do independent research, uh, you, you can do something. I did not do empirical research, but I compiled. I looked at the research that is available and compiled information out of that. Um, Thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot about trauma, and my question is child's trauma. And my question is, uh, given what you do, you come and talk about these issues, um, don't you think that you're also creating an environment of trauma by, you know, cherry-picking scientific studies, uh, citing discredited studies like the Littman study on gender dysphoria that you've cited? Sorry, uh, which study did I cite? Littman, Lisa Littman. Rapid onset and gender dysphoria. So, you cited that one. It's, it's been yeah, widely discredited. It's just an example of the sort of things that you've brought up. So well, my question why is... Why is that discredited? It was published it was. in 2015, no? 2020. It was published in 2020. Mm -hmm. And it was... Okay. So th setting that aside, um, don't you think that by, you know, presenting children's lived experience as false beliefs, as being fantasy world, and basically declining the possibility that you might be mistaken, right? You're very forceful, you're saying common sense and biological sex and all of these things. Don't you think that you're contributing to the environment of trauma that these kids and then adults face in our society? So basically my question is, do you think this is a possibility that you're contributing to the trauma? Thank I, you. I believe that we all have to tell the truth as far as we know. And I'm saying what I know, and you can say what you know, but I am obliged to say what I believe is true. Thank you. Uh, Áno, slečna, tu napredu. Počkajte, počkajte. I would like to react on your answer. Um, just asking that, what about then the truth of transgender people? How so can what, we contribute to... So what is their truth? No, do, do you think it's inborn? Do you yeah. think it's biologically fixed? There's no evidence what, for that. No, wait. Can I ask the question? Sorry, sure. but Sorry. You, didn't, you didn't talk about the discrimination, about the violence, about any societal factors which influence maybe the mental issues transgender go through, you know? So what, what about their truth in their, this sense that it is still their life? It is still, you know, they are still human. So how can we, we humanize them? How can we help them? Uh, and prevent the discrimination in the society. Every adult person is free and has the liberty to live as they live, as they want to live. I was talking about vulnerable children and adolescents. That's really a difference. To say that um, they are suffering from emotional, uh, mental health disorders, because of discrimination, there isn't really any evidence for that. Um, so I'm against bullying, I'm against discrimination, but I also have to say what I believe is the truth, that it's not an inborn condition. People who are adults have the liberty ad to adopt a transgender identity, but for children, we should not send them down that medical path. 
Let me, let me give you another example. Ilan Meyer, who was, uh, was the main researcher who said that it was mainly about LGB people, uh, not about transgender people, that <clears throat> when, a, when a country does not offer a same-sex marriage, uh, this is minority stress and people uh, become mentally ill. There's no evidence for that, and in 2021, he um, published a new research showing that young LGB people suffer more from suicidality than older ones. So he said he was very surprised because he thought countries have become more liberal, but he finds that young people are suffering more than people who were young 30 or 40 years ago. So there is much more to that. And I agree, we need to do more research. We need to do more independent research. But what I find extremely difficult is that on the basis of questionable research, um, policies, health policies, national health policies are produced that exclude, for example, my point of view. I have experienced a lot of exclusion. So my final task is to sum this up. And uh, it, it's not so easy, but I will try. Uh, it, it seems it is possible to, uh, to accommodate truth and sensibility. Uh, it may be difficult, but it's worth to try. We have to have open minds as well as open hearts. Right? Is it? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, everybody who has come, everybody who has questions, everybody who is watching us, thank, and especially thank to Dr. Von Holt. I think we can give her uh, one great applause. Ďakujem aj moderátorovi dnešného večera. Poprosím pre ňoho jeden potlesk. Ešte pár. Ďakujem aj našim partnerom. Hlavní partneri sú advokátska kancelária Lysina Rožko Partner, spoločnosť Plout a Fond na podporu umenia, ktorý podporil festival z verejných zdrojov. Hlavní mediálni partneri, konzervatívny denník Postoj, portál Nové mesto, denník Štandard, partneri CUSK a Lesy Jasov. Pozývam vás aj na ďalšiu diskusiu, ktorá bude nasledovať o 8 hodine po prestávke, ale vonku, v záhrade paláca, s názvom Snowflake Generation, spolu so štyrmi mladými ľuďmi a Maxom Kašparu. No a zároveň vás pozývam, ak sa vám páči festival a vidíte zmysel v tom, čo robíme, tak nás môžete podporiť aj finančne a môžete to urobiť prostredníctvom stránky slh.sk alebo QR kódu, ktorý je na tých novinách, ktoré ste mali na sedačke na zadnej strane. No a pri odchode zavítajte do nášho BHD shopu, kde môžete nájsť kávu, knihy, takéto skvelé chválonožky, ktoré vyrobili špeciálne pre Hanusové dní. A dokonca ich môžete použiť aj na Košické Hanusové dni, Bratislavské, lebo sú rôzne. A, no a hlavne je tam nové číslo časopisu Verbum, ktoré je vynikajúce, je tam veľa dobrých esejí, úvah, článkov, tak si ho môžete kúpiť v našom shope. A keď nemáte predchádzajúce dve čísla, tak aj tie sa môžete kúpiť. Tiež sú veľmi dobré a je to nadčasový časopis, takže určite sú aktuálne aj teraz. BAD Shop je potom na terase vonku. No a e, teraz teda budeme sa musieť všetci presunúť, pretože ďalšie podujatie bude vonku. Tí, čo máte lístky aj na tú diskusiu, môžete ostať v záhrade. Všetkých ostatných poprosím sa presunúť e, do tej terasy a tam si môžete dať pivo víno alebo čapovanú kofolu a pokračovať v diskusii aj na túto tému napríklad. A nezabudnite zobrať tieto noviny, ktoré sú tu pre vás. Takže ďakujem a pekný večer. Dovidenia.